nuclear diamond batteries finally hit the market. Batteries are probably the greatest invention of the modern world, used in small devices, such as your quartz watch, mobile phones, airpods, to even larger machines like battery-powered cars, such as those produced by Tesla. But before we get into this video any further, make sure you subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to be reminded of our any future videos. And if this video interested you, and you watched till the end, consider giving it a like. Alright, let's jump in. Luigi Galvani, an Italian physician discovered by accident in 1780, that muscles constrict when two different metals are brought into contact with one another. His discovery laid the foundation for the development of modern batteries, inadvertently creating the galvanic cell with his frog leg experiment, Galvani. A circuit was created when an electrolyte, the water in the frog's leg, and two distinct electrodes, the two metals, combined. Alessandro Volta created the Volta column in 1800s as a result of this information. In a sandwich configuration, several galvanic cells were stacked on top of one another. A cardboard disc drenched in salt water and a copper and zinc sheet made up each cell. A wire connecting the top and bottom cells produced a continually flowing electric field. Then came the lead-acid batteries. John Wilhelm Ritter, a physicist, improved the galvanic cell in 1801, allowing it to be recharged after being discharged. Wilhelm Joseph Sinstetten created the lead-acid accumulator with the aid of his invention and the use of lead plates. The lead-acid battery, which is regarded as the first rechargeable battery, was developed from this in 1859 by Gatson Plante. Currently, lead-acid batteries and lead-acid accumulators still feature its general design and cell configuration. The zinc manganese dioxide battery was created by Canadian engineer Lewis Urey. In the 1950s, American consumers looking for longer-lasting batteries for the newest craze in transistor radios boosted the adoption of this novel technology. Urey discovered during his research that adding manganese oxide, zinc powder, and an alkaline material to batteries could significantly extend their shelf life, which is the main reason they're utilized in so many consumer devices and home appliances. Stanford Ofschinski developed a nickel metal hydride NIMH battery in the early 1990s that did not require the use of hazardous metals like cadmium during production. NIMH batteries are able to have two to three times the capacity of nickel cadmium batteries of the same size by utilizing a hydrogen absorbing alloy in place of the cadmium. This invention provided batteries with never before seen high energy density, extended life, high power, and durability, along with quick charging capabilities. The innovative technology which was soon adopted as industry standard for use in the first hybrid electric vehicles is still present in many modern cars, notably the well-known Toyota Prius. However, over the past 10 years, the even more potent, portable, and long-lasting lithium-ion battery has generally replaced anti-image batteries. Then came the lithium-ion batteries which have been used till date and the ones we are most acquainted with. English chemist Stanley Wittingham experimented with employing lithium, metal, and titanium disulfide as the electrodes while he was employed by Axon Mobile in the 1970s. Axon stopped the research once this proved unstable. The cathode was changed from titanium disulfide to lithium cobalt oxide by American engineering professor John B. Goods Enough in the early 1980s, which increased the battery's energy potential but did not address the safety issues. Five years after Good Enough made his discovery, Akira Yoshino of Maiju University in Nagoya, Japan conducted an experiment using petroleum coke as the anode rather than reactive lithium metal. The first prototype lithium-ion battery was created as battery performance and safety considerably enhanced without the presence of lithium metal. However, the lithium-ion batteries do have their downsides. The strength of lithium-ion batteries and cells is not as high as that of certain other rechargeable technologies. They need to be guarded against being overcharged and discharged excessively. In addition, they must keep the current within acceptable bounds. As a result, one drawback of lithium-ion batteries is that protection circuitry must be added to guarantee that they be kept within their safe operating ranges. The strength of lithium-ion batteries and cells is not as high as that of certain other rechargeable technologies. They need to be guarded against being overcharged and discharged excessively. And now, probably the most awaited upgrade in the world of batteries, the nuclear diamond batteries have hit the open market. Traditional chemical or galvanic batteries, such as the lithium-ion cells in a smartphone or the alkaline batteries in a remote control, excel in generating a lot of power in a brief period of time. Only a few hours can pass before a lithium-ion battery needs to be recharged, and after a few years it will have lost a significant portion of its charge capacity. 
In contrast, the goal of nuclear batteries or beta-voltic cells is to continuously produce small amounts of power. Although, they can't supply enough energy to run a smartphone, depending on the radioactive material they employ. They may be able to give small gadgets a constant stream of electricity for countless ages. The business is considering uses for sensors in dangerous or distant areas, on satellites or at nuclear waste dumps, where it is either impossible or impractical to change batteries frequently. In addition, Boardman sees domestic uses for the company's nuclear batteries, such as in pacemakers or wearables. Instead of the reverse, he imagines a world in which people swap out their devices but keep their batteries. You'll be changing the fire alarm a lot sooner than you'll need to change the battery, Boardman says. But how exactly does a nuclear diamond battery work? A typical beta-voltic cell is made up of two semiconductors and several thin, foil-like layers of radioactive material. When nuclear material spontaneously decays, it releases beta particles, which are extremely energetic electrons or positrons, which knock electrons loose in semiconductor material to produce an electric current. A nuclear battery is comparable to a solar panel in this regard, with the exception that a nuclear battery's semiconductors absorb beta particles as opposed to photons. A nuclear battery's capacity is strictly limited, just like that of solar panels. The power density decreases with increasing distances from the radioactive source to the semiconductor. Therefore, the power of the cell will decrease if the battery's layers are more than a few microns thick. Furthermore, because beta particles are randomly emitted in all directions, only a small portion of them will really strike the semiconductor and turn into electricity. Hubbard claims that a nuclear battery's efficiency of roughly 7% is considered to be state-of-the-art in terms of the amount of radiation it can transform into power. Perhaps not surprisingly, a lot of people don't like the idea of something radioactive being anywhere near them. However, the health risks associated with beta voltics are equivalent to those associated with exit signs, which produce their distinctive red glow using the radioactive substance tritium. Beta particles, in contrast to gamma rays or other more harmful radiation types, can be stopped in their tracks by a thin layer of shielding as thin as just a few millimeters. Usually just the wall of the battery is sufficient to stop any emissions, says Lance Hubbard, a materials scientist at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory who is not affiliated with Arkenlight. The inside is hardly radioactive at all, and that makes them very safe for people. And he adds when the nuclear battery runs out of power, it decays to a stable state which means no leftover nuclear waste. The nuclear battery, which was once a cutting-edge technology, now appears ready to enter the mainstream. All of our devices don't necessarily need to last for thousands of years, nor do we want them to. However, once we do, we'll have a battery that keeps running and running and running. And that is it guys, thank you so much for watching and once again if you enjoyed it, like and share the video. And if you want more of this stuff, then please consider subscribing and clicking on the bell icon. We will see you soon with a new video.